everybody. This is the Let's Talk Kids Health Facebook Live Author Book Club with Dr. Victoria Dunkley. As you know, we've been reading this book over March and April. And if you haven't read the book, it's right here, Reset Your Child's Brain, a four-week plan. And it has been an amazing read. As a behavioral pediatrician, I can tell you that after reading this, I just feel reinvigorated about making sure I ask the question about screens often and always <laughs> because um, Dr. Dunkley pre presents a really great um, kind of narrative here about why we need to be thinking about screen time and its effects on a young child's brain. Um, so let, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Dunkley. Um, so she is an award-winning integrative child psychiatrist based at the Center for Life in Los Angeles. She's also a nationally recognized expert on the impact of screen time on the developing brain and leading voice regarding screen time's influence on misdiagnosis and overprescribing in children. She was recently named one of America's top psychiatrists. Dr. Dunkley has also been featured on such media outlets as Psychology Today, NBC Nightly News, CNN, NPR, and Good Morning America. And she's here with us today. She is the author of this book, Reset Your Child's Brain, now published in 10 languages. So I am so excited. If you're here watching live, please go ahead and put in comments and saying hello where you're calling, uh, watching from. And it, as soon as you can, put, start putting in your comments uh, questions, observations, if you read along. And if you haven't read along, it's okay. If this if this is like, oh, I've got to get this book, please do get the book. Okay. <laughs> but you feel free to um, interact with her and ask some questions. So Dr. Dunkley, thank you so much for coming today. Thanks, Dr. Bauer. I'm so happy to be here. Oh my goodness, this is so great. And again, I want to first acknowledge the fact that you're um, you know, joining us today. And I already have some questions from other folks who um, sent them in previously. So I'm gonna go ahead um, and before we turn over to those questions, if you don't mind, um, maybe just sharing briefly how you got interested in this topic. Sure. So I've been actually work, focused on this area with screens um, for almost 20 years now. So I, I started when I first finished my psychiatry training, my child psychiatry training, and I was working with a lot of kids in foster care group homes. Um, they all had attachment disorder and, and traumatic backgrounds. So those kids went into fight or flight very easily. So they had like a hair trigger response to stress. And I realized with those kids, like if they played any video games at all, they would become aggressive or more anxious, falling apart, they couldn't focus. And conversely, when we just stopped it altogether, not just cut down, but stopped it, um, then they could start to make progress. So from there, I started using that same intervention of, of no video games at all for um, kids in my private practice who just had more run of the mill anxiety, ADHD. Um, I was seeing a lot of kids with tics at the time. And it just seemed um, across the board, no matter what their diagnosis was, that they tended to get better. So I, I started to view it as that screens really put the brain into a state of stress and kind of short circuited the frontal lobe so that it, um, the kids were acting from a more primitive part of the brain um, and, and not able to access those higher functions of like executive functioning, regulating mood, uh, being creative, all those things that the things that make us human really. So, um, and then after that, I you know realized that like friends, neighbors, families, um, family members, um, colleagues, like all these people just had kind of describing the same picture of a kid who was uh, in a state of hyper arousal or very irritable or couldn't focus. Um, and it was, I just kept hearing the same picture over and over. And so even those kids, we realized, even if they didn't have a diagnosis, that they became dramatically improved in school, in their behavior, they were happier. The parents were like, oh, I have my kid back, you know. Um, so from there, you know, I started to, an email course and then, you know, I wrote the book a few, a few years later. And then as I was writing the book, the, a lot of the research was evolving as I wrote. So the book kept kind of evolving and then it, it went, and then it became not just my own experience, but all the, all the research was really backing up what I was seeing. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, in the book, you share so many case examples. Um, and what I like, um, for those of you who haven't read the book, um, also in, in the book, you, you actually have this great Appendix A, where you sort of highlight sort of the effects of screen time. So it's a, like right there, you can kind of see quickly um, what that it can do. And I know in the book, you, you, you coined the term uh, ESS. Can you describe that for the yes. viewers? Yeah. So ESS is electronic screen syndrome. And basically what that is, is when the nervous system becomes overstimulated from too much screen time. So that was kind of what I was alluding to earlier. This, this picture I kept seeing of a kid who was in a state of hyperarousal. Um, and that, that happens because screens activate the fight or flight response and not just one way, but many ways. There's the, the blue light from the screen. There's all the activity uh, movement. Um, the fact that this, the content itself is stimulating. There's the rapid pace. Um, and then we're often multitasking, which is also stimulating. Um, and then if you're using Wi-Fi, those, the, there's evidence that that is also um, activates the fight or flight response. And then on top of that, we know that blue light suppresses melatonin, which is the sleep signal. So uh, also, you know, screen time in general is, is very disruptive to sleep. And when you disrupt sleep, as we all know, when, you know with, especially with little kids, you can see it very obviously that they can't focus, they're falling apart. Um, so that's kind of what was going on. And then when that happens, like depending on the kid, like some kids might look like they're anxious while other kids might become aggressive. Others can't focus and they look like they have ADHD or a learning disorder. So even though the, the um, behind the scenes, like the things that are going on in the brain are the same, the way it presents is different in different kids. Yes. So that was what I, that's why I wanted to um, coin a term for it because I was seeing it in, you know, manifest in different ways. And, and I was seeing so many kids who are being misdiagnosed and put on medication unnecessarily. And a lot of the psych beds have horrific side, you know, long-term side effects, weight gain, um, high cholesterol, high blood sugar, movement disorders, all sorts of things can happen with psych meds. And we know that they're being prescribed, you know, in the last 10 years, they're being prescribed a lot more. So that was um, another reason I wanted to coin that terms so of people would, could say, oh, it's, it's not necessarily this, it could be ESS, and you need to rule that out before even considering medication or, you know, other types of therapy. So a lot of things a lot of therapies won't work if that's going on because you're not addressing the root cause. The root cause, yeah. So um, for those of you watching, again, if you have comments, reactions to what's being said and or questions, please don't hesitate to put them in now. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and I had some people send in some ahead of time. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with those. But again, I'll be kind of monitoring for any live questions too. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think what, what struck me in the book and some of the other readers was the fact that you go into screens in general. And obviously there's this feeling of, you know, overwhelm and hopelessness a little bit from families as they read this because they're like, okay, so TVs, computers, tablets, phones, I mean, the whole array, you say screens in general, but you do have this nice way of kind of saying, you know, like passive viewing versus interactive and farther away and closer and, um, you know, but for some families, it can be really, really hard to even begin to know where to start. Um, like, so I have this question from someone who says, what do you do if your child has to be around screens? Like if they're homeschooled for e-learning, is there a way for someone to just detox if they have to be around screens for like their school or their job? Okay. So, uh, you know, obviously this is a common question. Even if they're not being homeschooled, the kids are exposed to screens in school a lot, you know, and it varies depending on the school, but, um, so, so one thing you can do is just try to do the reset and just leave that the school piece out of it and just try to get rid of all entertainment based screen time. So and then if it doesn't work, then you can try to address the school piece. So in, for, for some kids, like um, it may be just talking to a teacher, it may need a doctor's note, something, but and then you may not still not get rid of all of it, but you could there's a lot that goes on at school that's that's not necessary. <laughs> So um, like using it as a reward or letting kids play at, re you know, at recess or whatever. Um, so 
I kind of use it, address it as a troubleshooting mm -hmm. issue if the reset doesn't work. Um, now, if they're being homeschooled, first of all, most kids can't tolerate being on the screen for the whole, as we saw with the pandemic, you know, we now we have all these kids who are anxious and depressed and having tics and all sorts of other, you know, things from too much stimulation. Um, so most children cannot tolerate that, in my opinion. Um, I can say out of my entire 100 kids in my practice right now, I think I had one that tolerated it, but for a couple hours a day and that was it. And everybody else was a mess. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. It's like, if you're homeschooling, see if there if you can at least get some of it to be paper alternatives. Um, and then really think about the reasons why you're homeschooling, you know, because I think different people have different reasons. But there's also groups that facilitate more, you know, less screens and their homeschooling groups. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's 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 still worth trying to get rid of all the other stuff. I think, as you mentioned, um, I, I've had I had some families that when they were doing virtual learning during the pandemic, they used a TV instead, like so it was further away and then they just connected the laptop to the TV. Um, and that way the kid could move around a lot more. Mm. Um, and then also I had a lot of parents who just simply turned the laptop the other way and they could just listen to the teacher, but, at, but didn't have to see the screen. So the screen itself is really stimulating. It's really hard to get past that one piece. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah. it's, it's a lot, and you have to suppress things and pop-ups and notifications and stuff. Like it's just, it's a lot of cognitive work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you do in your book, you also go into, you know, sort of um, like the screen dimming if you can't get by and um, yes. and all of that as well. I mean, are there other strategies that you can just yes. kind of recall so, for the readers? Yeah. So that um, most devices now will have some kind of nighttime a setting that, that will make the screen more red or dim and you can usually adjust it. Um, just Get Flux has, you can put that on pretty much any device but yep. it reddens everything. But also the brightness itself, as you mentioned, um, is a separate setting that you could, should use to be able to turn it down. So most people, I mean, to me, like they use the, the brightness is way too bright in the contrast settings too. You can turn those down too. Um, so visually and cognitively, if you turn that stuff down, you almost want it to look the same as the background. Yes, yeah. as close as you can to have it more natural. And then also um, blue block, sunglasses, blue block glasses mm -hmm. that block the blue light. Those can be helpful. I, I use those at work sometimes. Um, some people say they can get a headache from them, but I think it's just because they're, you know, if they, if they adapt to it, it that can go away. Um, yep. And then, to, you know, taking lots of movement breaks, things like that, you know, those things help too. Yeah. So I uh, just a comment from somebody. This is great. I'm driving, but do have some questions. So once you stop driving, get to where you need to, <laughs> yeah. please uh, throw some in there. Thank you for commenting. And then a question from Liza. So how do you feel about knowing all the available information that schools are so dependent on iPads now? I mean, is there even room for parents to advocate and work collaboratively with schools to bring up this issue? Yeah. Um, Okay. First of all, my son is about to start kindergarten. So I'm living this now, okay. um, you know, touring all these schools and there, everyone says, Oh, all the schools are doing it now. And I don't think that's true from what I'm seeing. Like some of the schools are definitely waiting to the later years and some schools that weren't doing it at all because of the pandemic. Now they are using them and other schools because of the pandemic, they're like, we can't stand this. We're getting rid of it altogether. <laughs> so every school is different. I, um, but I do think, there are parents who are getting together and um, starting little coalitions and addressing this issue at a district level. I just start. I just heard from a, a parent who got um, the Amer there are all these different physicians and everything to sign this letter saying like we need to get rid of the iPads at least in kindergarten and first grade, which seems crazy to me that they're insisting the kids have one to one devices at that at that age. But um, I do think it helps to complain um, as an individual parent. And then when groups of parents start complaining, then things start to happen. So I do definitely use your voice. Um, when I work with people individually, I will often just write a note on 
you know, just on a prescription pad saying this child has to have no screen time. And then usually sometimes they'll give me some pushback and I have to explain why I write a more detailed letter. Sometimes I actually make it like a medical waiver request. Mm -hmm. So it's more formal and that, you know, it goes into their chart and everything. Um, and then sometimes the teachers are like, oh, sure, we can do that. We can work around that. So I, I usually start in, at the individual level. And then once, once, you know, your child's doing okay, then spend your energy like trying to get other parents on board or, and then, you know, ask that policies be changed and don't take no for an answer. Cause I almost always get no the first time around the second time around the third time around. And then you just keep, you know, I always ask, why are you, why are you insisting on this? A lot of times it's, some people say it's the common core. Some people say it's, um, oh, they have to get used to it for the assessments, the standardized testing. But I, I know that not every school is doing it. So I know that some of these excuses aren't really valid. Um, and then sometimes I say, well, can we just let it go for a month and see how we, this person, this child does? Yep, and then yep. they might say, okay, well, let's just try it. And then when they see the child change, then they, it's eye opening for them, for the teachers. And then, you know, then you get another person in your corner. Yes. Yeah. So use your voice and advocate. And um, I think the more knowledge is power, right? And so the more parents or other folks that you can, you know, present your arguments for and look mm -hmm. for ways. And I like that idea that, you know, maybe even doing it as an experiment. I mean, I think that's how you present it to talk to kids too. Well, let's just do a quick, you know, let's do an experiment. We're going to just kind of see if how everybody's mm -hmm. feeling after this fast um, and, and just kind of take note. Like, let's talk about it. Let's have an ongoing conversation. You know, yeah. what are the effects that we see? And I do have and in my in my book, there's a chapter just on schools, like mm -hmm. so you can really to help you with your own child. Um, but also this Children's Screen Time Ac Action Network, um, they have a screens in school tool toolkit uh -huh. uh, that kind of prevents information that you can if you wanted to present something to the school or to the district. OK, and that was Children's Screen Time. Yeah, Children's Network. Screen Time Action Network. Got it. Action Network. Got it. Okay. And I'll put that in the show notes too when, when we're done here. Um, so I have this, this is a common question that many, I'm scrolling through the questions that I got ahead of time. Uh, I, I know you address this in the book, but um, someone wrote in saying she had read another book and was just really, uh, like surprised at like some of this data, like like something along the lines of screens are more effective than morphine for controlling pain, measurable changes in the brain after only a week of 10 hours of screen time. And so she gets, and she understood like the rationale for limiting or taking it away. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you do this and not be the bad guy? <laughs> mm -hmm. She, you know, I, I think this is one of the biggest struggles that parents mm -hmm. have. Like intuitively we know this to be true, but it's like that feeling like, like, oh gosh, how am I going to deal with like the aftermath of like the tantrums, the yelling, the screaming, all of that, the aggression, right? Mm -hmm. um, quick tips of words of wisdom other than also just like reading the book, but you know, yeah. anything. I think the more that you understand what's happening in the brain, not just that there's damage, but actually like how that damage happens, then it becomes less of a, you become less ambivalent about it <laughs> because you, if you really understand and you understand how those mechanisms translate into what you're seeing, um, then then it becomes, OK, I just have to figure out a way to do this because this is, you know, this is what's going on. This is what I see in my child. Usually you have to have some motivation, like the child's struggling in some way at school. Um, maybe they don't maybe they have friends online, but don't have friends in, in real life or they don't have they don't have face to face time. Maybe they're, um, you know, not in sports or they're overweight or deconditioned or whatever. You have to have most parents to really do the reset. They have to have some kind of motivation that's, you know, pushing them to do something more drastic. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, and I always say that it's it's just more effective to do cold turkey at least four weeks. It's to me, it's the gold standard, bar none. Um, so of course, I have a lot of families that just want to moderate and well, can we just do this first and then. Of course they can. I don't live in their house, but I mean, <laughs> um, but the problem I see is that it just drags things out. So then two years goes by and we're still having the same conversation. And I'm like, you know, sooner or later, you're going to have to reset everything. Because one of the things that happens is 
with all screen stimulation is um, the dopamine receptors get overstimulated. So those reward pathways are constantly being hammered. And then the dopamine receptors actually um, downregulate. So if you if you think of it, of the little dopamine receptor on a cell, if they get hit so many times really hard, they, they downregulate. And then the receptor is not even there anymore. It's not expressing itself. So the only way to fix that is to remove whatever's causing those dopam that dopamine stimulation. And so you really have to get rid of all of that screen stimulation for all of those things to reset and, and come back up. The clock has to reset. Um, and that another that's another thing that I don't really see the sleep and the body clock resetting until we remove everything. So that's why I, I always talk about the physiology, because when you understand the physiology, then you understand why everything has to be removed. You know, we all see kids who go to camp and there's no devices there and they come back and they're like a new person. Um, and but you shouldn't have to go to camp to get that. You know, I really do. Even though it sounds hard, I have many hundreds of families, if not thousands, who have done this at home. Um, of course, it's easier if you can find another family to do it with you. It's easier. Yes. But most families I work with don't have that, you know, and they still do it. And then they may end up talking another family into it when, you know, when, the, when everybody else sees the benefits. But um, I just think if you really if you really understand what's going on. Um, then you just figure out a way to make it happen. And then it's really only the beginning that's hard. So the first yeah, week, yeah. first few days, for little kids, it's really short, actually. Just a, a day or two, you can start seeing a difference. But even with teens, um, after about a week, you'll you'll start to see differences. They're coming out of their room more. They're more social. They're laughing more. They're, they want to be with you more. And, um, and it's really important to realize also that screens hijack those attachment pathways. So... That's really with, with all addiction. They're all attacking, um, hijacking those attachment pathways. And we have those pathways, those were from an evolutionary point of view, to keep the child close to the mother, which helps survival. So that's why we have those. Um, and those are, you know, what are getting, um, what we're competing with. So if you re remove those and then you have to replace what you just took away with bonding time. So that's why part of the reset program is spending one-on-one -on -one time, not just family time, but it's really, really important to have one-on-one -on -one time where you're not distracted, you're totally present and have eye contact, face-to-face uh, -face contact. And that helps not just regulate their nervous system and help them feel loved, but that you're literally replacing those, you're re rewiring their brain to have those tracks be filled with attachment instead of screens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And I think, so your answer right there, I think, touched on what Liza was asking. So she's in the process of detoxing their daughter, but not successful. Um, and again, um, I think you spend a really nice job in your book that first week, even just planning it out and really like prescribe, mm -hmm. like thinking about, okay, we're going to take this away, like doing a whole like scour of the house and getting other adults on board who interact with the child, looking for any screens that are in the environment, planning out activities and, and having people kind of sign up for that. And then you also advocate for, for um, doing it with a friend because it's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, but is, do you have any other, any other words of wisdom for Liza? Um, um, well, of course, I'd, I'd need to know more like how old the child is. But a lot of times when it's not working, it's because there's something still there. It could be something they you know are hiding in their room or it could be they're going over someone's house and getting it, or it could be school. So the troubleshooting section really goes over. These are all the things that happen um, or, or they're not getting enough time with the parent, but you, there's usually something else there if it's not working. Okay. Um, so somebody else uh, sent in a question. I know, so this is, I'm just reading it. I know that uh, Dr. Dunkley talked in the book about how each child is different with reintroducing screen time. So this is presumably after the fast. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing fine right now with quote, passive screen time with TV shows, documentaries. He's not asking too much for his iPad, but he does mention it from time to time. But when I do give his iPad back, I'll be playing, um, I'll be playing this game. Uh, mm -hmm. he'll, he'll be playing this game. Huge part of me doesn't want to give it back at all. So I'm holding off for as long as I can. When I do reintroduce, would it be good to start with a half an hour on weekends only? I'm afraid to really open up a big can of worms here. 
Okay. Well, there's your answer right there. <laughs> Why would you open up a big can of worms? I mean, yes. to me, to me, the iPad is the worst because I don't know, there's something about it. Aside from the fact that it's so easy to carry around and it's just so convenient, but there's something about the iPad that I feel like I always tell parent like families to just get out of the house. Um, I, I, there's no reason to have it. I mean, so if you if he, if you guys are already doing fine and and even during the reset, we do allow a little bit of, you know, five hours or less of passive TV. So if what you're doing is working, I would just stay with that. The longer the more time you have under your belt or under your child's belt, I guess it is um, of, of not having that iPad, the better. So um, and same with phone, like the, the longer you delay giving them a phone, the better. So the more weeks, months, years that their brain has without that, without that exposure, you're, it's an investment. Mm -hmm. So that's how I would look at like the, the more you keep the iPad out of there, you know, if you're doing okay, like I wouldn't even consider giving it back. And in fact, like I said, I would just get it out of the house. So it's not even a question. Yeah. So, and somebody else just commented, I want to say I've done it with my ADHD son and it worked. He's so much happier, social, family relationships have improved. He's more confident and physically active. She And and I didn't even do it fully, just a week of no screens during spring break. Then now we just do TV shows and documentaries. I haven't even tried to touch school and feel a huge difference. And so do his teachers. Well, and good. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. That's yeah. And great. That's good to hear too, that like, I do hear from families, um, that they they do just leave school out of the picture and the kid is getting some screen exposure with school but mm -hmm. it still works so yeah it's definitely yeah. doing as much as best as you can as clean as you can but just you know you can't control everything yep yep um so another question how to handle peer pressure to play games and compete i know he knows he's better off without games but part of him feels like he's missing out yeah, that's a good question. I think um, it sounds like you're you're already ahead of the game because if they ha if the child has some awareness, that's really good. So I would just keep talking about his brain and why you're doing what's best for his brain because you love him and this really is out of love. It's not out of punishment, right? Mm -hmm. um, and help him kind of problem solve like different scenarios and maybe what to say um, and maybe find at least a couple friends that even, you know, that even if they're not screen free, like maybe just aren't as big of gamers. Like that's what I see sometimes is kids just kind of migrate to different friend groups because yep. a lot of times they're like looking at their friends after they've, you know, been more relatively screen free. And they're like, gosh, all they do is play games. That's all they talk about. And they get bored of it. So, you know, you may, he may need to get some new friends, but a lot of times this, the friends, they do adapt and yeah, you know, they're good friends. They'll they'll accept what's going on. Yep. I have another question or comment coming in right now. Um, so I'm going to share this. I believe in the value of detoxing from screens, but how do you handle the children that feel depressed from being disconnected from friends, angry at parents because they feel mm -hmm. parents are keeping them from doing something that everyone else around them at school is doing? I feel like I'm replacing one set of behaviors with another. He might be feeling connected at home and less hyperactivity and distraction, but also feeling isolated from things that friends are doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, this is also a common issue, obviously, with preteens and teens yes. and mm -hmm. social media. Um, there's a group called Screen Strong that they have a really good Facebook group that um, the, is a good place to ask these kind of questions, but I'll also, you know, share my experience. But I think, um, can, I, can you put that up again? I will. Hold on okay. one second. There we go. Okay. So I couldn't tell um, it, if there was some detox already going on. Um, but I think, you know, one thing, like I talked about earlier, is like, you can't, if, when you replace, when you take the screens away, you have to make sure that you're spending enough one-on-one -on -one time with the child. Cause, um, there's another great book called, um, hold on to your kids. And he talks a lot about, do you know that book? No, Talk but I'm, I'm, okay. I'm pulling that up now. Cause okay. I'm going to put all of these in the resource yeah. section. But he mm -hmm. talks about how, um, oh, yeah you know, how teens these days are, their their tribe is turning into their peers, whereas in the past, up until about 100 years ago, 
the tribe is always, I mean, you've always stayed with your family until you were an adult, really. You didn't have this tribe of teens who are teenage. They're still children, like, and they're supposed to be giving you advice. Like, so, you know, we've kind of, a lot of kids um, have lost that mentorship piece with their, with their own parents and parents just think, oh, well, this is what they're supposed to be doing. But really that, you know, if you have the stronger relationship is with a child, um, then they feel connected to you and they don't, they may still feel a little bit left out, but it's, it, it's not as strong as, if, you know, when your relationship with them is good. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, at the very beginning of the fast, of course, they're going to be angry. Um, and, and we do a whole safety plan for, for in cases where the kid might actually, you know, become physically aggressive or some kids threaten to hurt themselves. Um, for, so just briefly, like for the safety plan, if, if we, we like make, um, you know, if this happens, you do this, if this happens, you do this complete with all the way down to calling 911, if the child is really being, you know, violent. Um, right. and then in the case of when child, when a child is threatening that they would go into a state of despair, it's really one-on-one time. So sometimes I even have parents like sleep in the child's room until they feel, um, you know, less out of sorts. Cause it's really like they, you know, especially girls and social media, they feel like you cut off their left arm, you know, they just feel yes. really um, out of sorts, but it's, and, and kind of disorganized. So you have to like replace that with, with the Bonnie time. And if you have to take a few days off of work or something like that can help just really make sure that they feel okay. Mm-hmm. But kind of relate, related to that, especially with our tweens and teens who do have their own devices and texting, can you comment on that? Yeah, I think, um, so, in, well, in terms of the reset, so what we try to do is do the reset, um, and then afterwards, depends on what's going on with the child. Um, so, and I don't think I ever answered that other question now that you're mentioning it about what happens um, after the after the reset. But um, I think for for some for some families, the the parent will say, okay, you can text, you can use my phone to text for a little while each night, and they don't, the kid doesn't get their own smartphone back yet, and mm-hmm. then. Um, a lot of parents find the Gab phone is really helpful. And I was just talking to a family this past weekend and um, they have a 12 year old daughter and she got her daughter a Gab phone and all the other parents had already given smartphones, but they decided together to just do all Gab phones. Mm-hmm. And all of the parents say, oh, we can see such a difference in our girls compared to the other girls because they're, they're so much more social and they make eye contact and stuff because they're not constantly on social media. Um, so I do, you know, there's there's different ways to do it, I think. But um, again, that screen strong group is a, is a good place to ask really specific questions like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but back to what we, the other parent was asking about after the reset. So some yes. some families, you know, it depends on if there's, you know, if a child is on the spectrum or they have attachment disorder or, you know, or really depressed, things like that, then you, you have to be more careful. And some kids just can't tolerate any you know, we, we do the reset and then they try a little bit and everything just falls apart. Other kids, um, they do, you know, they, in, the parents reintroduce and they do okay. Um, and then some time goes by and things start to slip again. So then we do another reset yeah. and then yeah. other kid, and then sometimes that happens over and over again, it's kind of a learning curve. And then they get a little bit older and their, their brains a little bit more mature and then they're able to tolerate some. So it depends on the child's resilience. Um, like what kind of activities they're involved in, their social support, their their attachment to the family. So every case is kind of different and you just have to kind of watch what's happening to see what the answer is in, in your specific case. Yeah, I, I remember a specific case that you talk about where the child themselves realized how they were not feeling well after, you know, and so mm-hmm. on their own, just like gave up their play, like got it out of their bedroom. They're like, no, this, I don't need yes. this anymore, yes. which is what we want. We yes. want our kids to like buy into this process and be like, okay, yes. I can see this is how I'm feeling. I don't yes. need this. And a lot of parents will say to me, oh, my parent, my child just smashed their iPad or just threw their device in the toilet. Like I have so many parents that they it. threw it in the toilet. <laughs> that your child's telling you something. (laughs) Um, I have another question here uh, from Jessica. If screen time affects or worsens a tick disorder, how soon would you expect to see an improvement after going screen free? It it depends on the tick disorder. So if the ticks are really just 
being brought on by screens um, and they didn't have a tick disorder before that, they should go away. So usually within a few weeks, but sometimes screen uh, ticks are stubborn. Is that sometimes they can take you know a couple months to see a difference. But I would just I would say usually within a few weeks you can see a difference. Um, and then you know like I said, if they have an underlying tick disorder or Tourette syndrome or something, it may not go away completely, but it will definitely get better. Yes, that is one of the rewarding things to see. I think and um, is the is the kids with ticks because you can you can visibly see the ticks get better you know and that's a rewarding thing to see because it's you know ticks are it's a quality of life issue yeah yeah for sure um i also have another question uh, this is sort of like maybe helping brainstorm some uh substitute um uh activities so for for this person she says that her teen spends a lot of time on her phone ipad using music producing programs and apps mm -hmm. she loves to make her own songs but this of course entails many many hours just isolated on her phone mm -hmm. i don't really want to limit her love of music but sometimes it is so much time spent doing it yeah i i think for you know they do say in general that when you're creating something not like creating something on Minecraft, but like creating something like that where you're like making an actual, you know, end product or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that that is more protective than like spending time consuming without doing something. However, um, I would still say for some for a case like that, if they're spending that much time, it's worth taking breaks. You know. Um, Obviously, like, like I said, the gold standard would be taking a four week break and then seeing what's different or if she if there's any way to do it differently. But it, it would give her brain a break. And that is a lot of stimulation and time spent, like kind of locked in to that, which kind of keeps you shut away from the real world. Mm -hmm. So it can kind of it, it just helps to give the brain a break and help her kind of, you know, Re reattach to the real world instead of being so internalized. And we used to let leave, let kids um, listen to music on their headphones, just take away the screen, but let them listen with headphones. Uh -huh. And even that, I stopped doing that because I, I realized I had some kids who wouldn't, weren't getting better. And so we took the headphones away and then it worked. Um, oh, really? And that, now I'm hearing like the like restart is a, a tech addiction, like a residential facility. And uh -huh. I heard from the director there that they take away headphones. They talk about headphones too. So it's just, there's something about it that makes the brain more, you know, just kind of locked in and, and it's probably mm. the, stimu the auditory stimulation as well, but. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So kind of brainstorming with her, you know, like, cause I, I know this particular child goes to a music school. So like seeing if they could like make music in person, yes. uh, but I think like she also likes to remix things as well. So that is a little bit more challenging, but yeah. And I would say take a break and then if she could do it, you know, without using headphones and maybe yeah, doing it in person, things like that. So it's just not so zoned in on, on the yeah. screen. Okay. Um, do you have time for maybe a couple more, Dr. Sure. Duff? I want to be uh, respectful of your time because we're at uh, 508 here, our time. So yeah, okay. I'm, I'm fine if you're fine. Okay. Okay. Um, so we did get another question here from, I'm going to show this from Jamie. So has your research given any indication as to how limiting active screen time might impact children's long-term comfort with and preparation for the kind of tools and skills they will need as long as young adult learners, workers, communicators? Yes. Okay, so that is the issue that um, the ed tech companies and they're, they're always bringing that, oh, they have to be ready for the, the world today and we, they need to start early. But the, the, the research shows that um, learning tech skills are relatively easy. You know, they're, they're made to be intuitive. Um, and, it's, and that they're, especially compared to like learning, reading, writing, math, tech skills are relatively easy to learn, even at a later age, even for kids who have learning disorders. So it's much harder to teach the basics of reading, math, and writing, speaking, those kinds of things, um, spelling, all those things. Um, so it's much better to focus on those skills, and you really want to focus on um, brain integration. So if you're, if the more resilient the brain is, the more integrated it is, then the easier it is to have for them to have any any career, whether it's tech related or not. So I think it's just, it's not, it's not nothing to worry about, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. 
So there's this huge push, you know, they're, they're trying to teach kids early and earlier and often at the expense of things that we know build the brain, like movement and music and art. Um, so you're, and reading real books, like we, you're much better off using what we know that makes the brain bigger and stronger and more integrated. And those tech stuff, they can learn later. Like I didn't learn anything until I was like in my thirties. Right. And we all survive somehow we're all using this technology. So I, I just wouldn't worry about it. Okay. Great. Great. Um, I'm looking here. I, I mean, I think this is more, I, 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 I will read this, but I think it's more, we've already kind of talked about it um, because uh, this was sent in ahead of time, but I just want to make sure that the parent who sent it in can see this. Um, so uh, how to best balance the need for electronics, again, for with school socializing. But she mentions, though, when it's time to shut it down or take a necessary break, like eating, doing chores, going outside even, it's always a temper tantrum, mm -hmm. even with a countdown warning. Yeah. <laughs> so the aggressiveness that comes with electronics gaming, too, is a big deal. He says it's not related but to us, the more he plays, the angrier he gets when he's went off the computer. This is single-handedly the hardest issue at our house. Yes. So these are all very good reasons to do the reset. Um, yes. You know, this is this is why, like, like my work, um, Screen Strong, like, and people who really treat tech addiction, we all say the same thing, is because when you try to go, when you try to moderate, those addiction pathways are still in place. They're still mm -hmm. active. So so that's why you're always having a tantrum and arguments and because they're so hooked that they can't step away even with countdowns and all that stuff. So that is, you know, those are like red flags. Um, so that is, the, and those will all go away if doing the reset. I think um, that's one of the beautiful things that happens is, and they have to actually grieve that the, games or devices are gone if they think they're going to get it even on the weekends or something they're still constantly thinking about it and planning for it and waiting for it and then they don't explore their world so but if they when they realize it's actually gone they go through you know the whole grief series of anger despair bargaining and then finally acceptance then you see and i mean some kids go through that faster than others but then you start to see their world open up again and then the arguments go away and it's it's like so much less stress. So I definitely, you know, and you don't want to decide what you're going to do after the reset until you've done the reset. Then you can decide, do you want to reintroduce or do you want to just be a game free home or, you know, whatever it is. But you'll definitely be in a, you'll have so much more information to make these decisions. Yeah. But, and you say that clearly in the book. I mean, you say, you know, well you know, you're going to get a barrage of questions like, well, what's going to happen after? And, and you, and you, you really do provide some really good suggestions in terms of like not pigeonholing yourself and, you know, like just say like, we're going to take it one day at a time. We're yeah. going to kind of see how we all feel. Right. Yeah. Um, which I, which I love. Um, and you then just say, you just say, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen yet. Yeah. But we're just going to do this first and then we'll go from there. Yeah, we're doing this experiment. We're going to yeah. keep talking about it, right? Yeah. Um, and then somebody else sent in this question. So she said, my research is in the microbiome. You briefly touched on the effect of Wi-Fi on that. Can you elaborate more? I'm just so curious. Uh, of Wi-Fi on the microbiome? Yeah. Oh, that's one of my new topics that I'm interested in. <sighs> um, <laughs> I mean, I know there's, there's some research showing that it affects, um, definitely affects the skin microbiome that, Mm -hmm. just the screen itself and it's also like there's uv radiation from the screen and there's the wi-fi there's there's a lot of stuff going on um i myself have broken out before just from when i was working on the book i would just break out from being in front of the laptop all all the time it definitely changes something in the skin um i i think there, that's just like such a new topic and then time will tell but i definitely think um you know bacteria can get stimulated from all sorts of energy waves. So I, I definitely think something happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and can you briefly just um, tell the listeners um, about the uh, EMF and, uh, you know, your whole appendix on that? Can you just talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that? Yeah, so that, that was one of the topics that kind of came up as I was writing the book. And I just, I knew there was one more piece I was missing. And then I was like, this is it. Um, and then once I started learning about it, it's just, it was just a whole other world of research going on um but basically that you know the interesting thing was that it kind of does a lot of the same things that screen time itself does which is we there's 
um, it activates fight or flight. Um, there's some evidence that it's stimulating in a way that it has some opiate effects. Um, so this is probably contributing to the addictive process. Mm -hmm. um, and it also suppresses melatonin. So when you combine all those things together, you know, you, everything's just like synergistic and creates this vicious circle. Um, and I also think if you get rid of Wi-Fi in the house, you're cutting off a lot of the access. Um, it makes things so much easier. And I actually didn't cut off my own Wi-Fi until I was writing my book and I was just constantly distracted. And I, it was the only way I could like <laughs> work without constantly searching and stuff like that. Um, so I've been living that way for years and it, it, it definitely reduces access you know, immediately. Yeah. Um, but also just the effect, especially overnight and everything, like you don't want to have that on. Mm -hmm. I guess that's a good kind of lead into one, you know, kind of a couple more thoughts and then we'll kind of wrap up. But, you know, I think, um, you know, in kind of explicit in this, it always goes a lot better if parents can also kind of participate, sure. um, right? And you talk about kind of like that nature kind of reset um you know once you're once you're done with the fast like thinking about like longer term um ways that you can kind of commit to kind of either keeping it out or moderating um mm -hmm. and you mentioned like cutting out the wi-fi mm -hmm. um kind of making sure like it's at least eight feet away and all of these different things but but do you have any other like words for the parents who this may be the real reason why tackling a fast is going to be mm -hmm. hard because the teen will be like, well, I don't understand. Why do you get to use it? Or, right. you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really good point. I'm glad we circled back to that. Yes. Um, so I think, you know, I, I know parents often say like, well, I have to do it, use it for work. And, but if you can do some kind, even if it's modified, if you could do some kind of reset just shows solidarity with your child. So it's not just that you're punishing them. You're doing this together as a family because you love them. And then you write down, put in writing everything you're going to do. So if you have to check your device that you only do it, you know, once in the morning and once a night, and it's only at these hours or whatever, um, and try to ideally that you would be screened for yourself when, as soon as your kid comes home from school. Um, and then, like I said, if you have to, like you just do it during a designated period. If you don't follow through on what you're going to do, what we do is we have, um, you know, the parent has to pay a tax and we call it the accountability act. Um, and then, so that way the child feels like, aha, like I'm going to get you mom. <laughs> um, but it helps them feel like it's not just about them and they're, you know, that's not just them in the hot seat. Um, and then older kids, you know, what I always tell parents is like the kids who aren't really hooked, they'll go along with the, with doing it anyway. And the kids who are hooked, well, they, the siblings, like they could probably use a break too. So, you know, you may not have the same rules for every child, but everything should be kind of very clear during those four weeks of what's going to happen and who's going to do what and try not to use devices in, in the presence of someone who's in the middle of it. Um, and it's good to, you know, it's nobody's perfect. And this whole thing is a learning curve. So I think just keep working on it. Oh, you know, you have to keep tweaking and tweaking. Like somebody said to me, the reset, the reset was easy, but afterwards the life, like the lifestyle, living that lifestyle was the hard part because it was like learning to eat right and sticking to it. And it is kind of like yeah. that because it's always in our face, literally. Um, so you just, so I think that's why it's good to just surround yourself with people who are like-minded so that you can constantly be checking in and remind yourself why you're doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the difference between ESS and addiction, when does it cross the line? That's another question um, that I, I got. It's kind of a spectrum, um, but I think a lot of kids aren't necessarily addicted, but they still have, they're still overstimulated and are still having symptoms so or side effects. Um, so, so some kids, were, I would have some patients who were only like using screens like once a week or something. And, but that one day a week was enough to like dysregulate them and then they couldn't sort themselves out. And then when we got rid of it, then you could see a difference. Um, so those kids weren't probably weren't addicted per se, but they were still having side effects. Um, but I think the longer ESS goes on, the more, you know, it's going to head into addiction sooner or later. 
um, when I do the reset though, I think I've only really had a few kids that it took like six weeks or longer for them to reset and kind of come out of, come out of it. I mean, I would say 80 to 90% of even with teens, um, it's a lot faster, you know, a, a week or two and you start seeing a difference and then the rest of the reset is just enjoyable. So, um, I, I wouldn't get too hung up on that part. You just want to know, like, if you're worried about addiction, it's probably a possibility, you know, we're think it's, it's somewhere between 15 and 25% of the population is addicted. Mm -hmm. So it's high. Yeah. And it's not yeah. easy to treat when they're older. It's not at all. Yeah. Even if so, people have like a lot of resources, it's still hard. Mm hmm. Yeah. So anybody watching this and feeling kind of like ready to commit or and or a little bit overwhelmed at the same time. I mean, I think this is it's a it's common to feel all those different hosts of emotions. But um, I guess if it's a sum up, um, mm -hmm. if you're wanting more resources, please do check out um, Dr. Dunkley's uh, website. And then she did speak about her free email course that you can access by going there. So I'll leave that banner up. But is there any like last minute? word of advice for for folks i just I, I think just focusing on mother nature like you can't fool mother nature so anytime we, we get a, away from what we're meant to be naturally is where we get into trouble whether it has to do with food or play or anything you know um so i so a lot of the things that correct all this dysregulation is sunlight and green spaces and movement, like all those things we know, but sometimes it's hard to get the kids to do all those things that are protective and build resilience without removing everything. And um, so sometimes parents will say, oh, I did the reset, but it was just because it was what they were doing instead. It wasn't because I took the screens away. It's mm -hmm. both. So the screens dysregulate, but also what happens naturally when you remove everything is what builds everything back up. And it, sometimes it's just hard to get the kids to do all those things with screens in, in, in there. So there is definitely hope. All these, there's a bunch of um, different activities, yoga, all these things build the brain, but really just focusing on moving and getting outside and attachment goes a long way. Yeah. So somebody did say, yes, I'm ready, but overwhelmed. <laughs> yes. Is, I always say like, if somebody feels overwhelmed by the whole thing, I always say just keep reading or listening and stuff like wait to just keep taking in the information and then you'll you'll feel more ready sleep on it you know you don't have to do everything today mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and you even say like that week one preparation like it could be m more than a week it could be yes. just you know so so spend time like just getting ready like and enlist your support group find like you know other friends mm -hmm. to do it with you and yeah. uh, all of that and I think setting a like setting a date is good because mm -hmm. you want to strike while the iron's hot. But if you have to move that date, that's OK. But at least if you kind of have a date in mind, then you're like, OK, because a lot of times I'm like, well, just let me know when you're ready. And then when parents are ready, they're ready and they start, you know. So do you recommend, though, given that that parents wait to talk to their kids about it until so they're not like constantly moving it? Yeah, I think. It could go either way like um yeah you don't want to move it too much but i think if they have some kind of um so so they don't get blindsided yeah that helps but that said you also don't want to give them so much time that they start arguing with you all the time about it so you just want to really keep it like from the time you tell them to the time you start keep that within a you know a few days and just use your best judgment but um yeah i think um this there's a case a family we worked with the, for the good good morning america um and the video is on my website but um that case because of the production and everything it kept getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back but it turned out to be a good thing because by the time the kids by the time we actually did it the kids were like yeah we already know this is going to happen and so they were ready she took the, the way she was like they weren't that upset because <laughs> they knew it was coming so that was a time when i was like oh oh lord you know <laughs> it worked out okay um, yeah. and I think it helps, it helps to plan and all that stuff. But I think some kids, you know, they, you, as soon as you tell them, it's like the worst time, um, you know, that's the riskiest time. So I think you just have to case by case kind of figure out what your family needs. Yeah. Well, and that's a great um, kind of segue. Thank you, um, Dr. Dunkley, for this wonderful conversation. Again, if you end up watching this on replay, 
use hashtag replay to put in your questions and comments because I will be scanning that along with my virtual assistant. And if there are not, if there are questions that I can't answer, I will uh, kindly send it to Dr. Dunkley to see if she wants to chime in. Um, but again, for those of you who uh, were unable to meet and do this live, feel free to just post comments there and we'll get back to you. Um, and then also, this is a nice kind of uh, segue because my next parenting book club is Finding Eco Happiness, Fun Nature Activities to Help Your Kids Feel Happier and Calmer by, by Sandy <laughs> Schwartz. And so um, she will be talking with us at the end of next month so this is a nice kind of lead in to that. You could plan your fast and then get outside and come up with some fun activities. We planned it so that way it's like summer, perfect time to be outside anyway. So yeah. um, be on the lookout for that book um, and that book club that's going to be starting officially May 3rd because that's when um, you will get the book shipped to you, but it is already available for pre-order. Um, okay, so that being said, I wanna thank you, Dr. Dunkley, so much for spending almost a whole hour with us, um, sharing your thoughts, ex expertise, answering questions. Um, this is such a great and important topic, and I am so glad that um, you are at the helm and all of the kind of resources that you shared, I'm going to be putting in um, the show notes. So uh, the Children's Screen Time Action Network, Screen Strong, mm -hmm. uh, hold on to your kids, why parents need um, why, why parents need to matter more than their peers, that book, mm -hmm. and then the Gab Wireless. And then I'll put a link to your the video about good uh, from Good Morning America, too. Oh, great. So, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And again, um, I'll just throw up here one more time the banner. So that way you can please uh, go to Dr. Dunkley's website, check out her free email course, get on her email list. Um, and that way you'll get um, tips and uh, all of that and stay connected with her. She does have um, a Facebook account as well. Yeah. So um, please follow her and uh, keep that conversation going. I love that connection is so important. Attachment. It so, is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, on behalf of everybody watching live, I want to thank you uh, for spending the time. It was a pleasure talking with you today. You as well, Dr. Bauer. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, thank you. And it's not too late to get the book, guys. So keep, get the book and read and then come back and share your experiences doing the fast. And we'll, we'll kind of, you know, kind of be accountable with each other and support each other. All right? Yes. All right. Thank you so much. That's it for now. Mm -hmm.